Well, here we are again to look at uh, the characters of the Bible that we've been talking about the last few weeks uh, in our video series. And today we focus on the man Abraham. Well, actually his name was Abram when he was born, but God changed his name. Abram meaning a high man, Abraham meaning a father of multitudes. Interestingly, three religious groups in our world claim Abraham as the father of their faith, Christians, Jews, and Muslims. You say, well, how can that happen? Those are such diverse uh, positions to take. Well, it begins with the children of Abraham. Uh, God said to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. And Abraham got tired of waiting for God to give him and Sarah a child. So he decided on his own to take Sarah's handmaid, Hagar, and to have a child by her. That child's name was Ishmael. And Ishmael is the founder of the Arab peoples, the Muslims. Not officially Muslims, because of course Muhammad uh, did not even come on the scene until about 600 A.D., but he, he studied the Old Testament and brought a lot of what we would call today Islam into the teaching that he tried to propagate on the world. God did give Abraham and Sarah a son, and his name was Isaac. Isaac is the father of the Jewish people, and Isaac is also the line through which Christ comes and brings about redemption uh, in God's plan for what he had in mind. Let me just turn a little corner here for a moment. The Jews thought they were God's chosen people, and they were, but they thought they were chosen for God's special blessing. God had in mind that the Jews were to be a nation who would tell the story of God's love for the rest of the world. I was reading the other day a book by William Sanford Lazor uh, on personalities of the Old Testament, and he referenced a medical doctor's novel. The name of the novel and the doctor are not very important right now. But in the story, and you can make up lots of things when you write novels, in the story, Abraham's father was a maker of idols or a maker of gods. And so when he finished crafting a god and sold it to his neighbors or gave it to his neighbors, he said, now you are a god. Abraham challenged that and he said, how can something made by the hands of men become a god? He said, I want to worship the living god. And it was that living God who spoke to him and said, I'm going to make you a great nation. I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those that curse you. So Abraham became not only the father of the Jews, those who settled in Canaan as he did, but also he becomes the father of faith to all Christians, all who believe in Christ and all who follow through Isaac's example this picture of the child of promise that God was going to give to Abraham and Sarah. Genesis 12 through 25 covers uh, and includes the birth of Isaac. Uh, his uh, reference uh, points out that even though Sarah didn't believe and laughed when the angels came and said to Abraham, you're going to have a child. In that moment, God blessed her and blessed Abraham way beyond the time of normal childbirth. And Isaac is born and he becomes the designated heir uh, to Abraham. Abraham's mentioned in lots of ways in the New Testament as well. Do you remember the story Jesus told about the rich man who fared sumptuously in his life 
and the poor man Lazarus who laid outside his gate and begged for a piece of bread, but no one gave it to him. When the rich man died, he looked up, and Jesus says he was that Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. Paradise, in the conception of the Jewish people at that point, was like having a great feast where you lay down on a couch or a blanket and leaned against the next person at the table and you ate the supper that was prepared for you. Abraham's bosom was the place where the child coming home to paradise would lay his head. That was the picture that Jesus used when he talked about this rich man and his brothers in Luke 16. Paul speaks of Abraham's salvation in the book of Romans, chapter 4. And it, it's spelled out clearly that Paul says Abraham was saved by faith, not by works of righteousness, which he could do. The Bible clearly distinguishes between what we do to please God and what God does for us to bring about our salvation. Jesus died on the cross so that you and I might have eternal life. That shedding of his blood was the symbol of forgiveness by God's grace for all of us. So Paul could say in Ephesians chapter 2, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we don't come to God and say, God, here I am. I'm a righteous person. Take me in. Now, when we come to God, we all have to confess, God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. And because of Christ, open the door to eternal life to me. Abraham becomes the figure through whom each of us receive eternal life in the same way he did, by faith. So the book of Hebrews continues Abraham's story, and in the, chap the 11th chapter, which we call the Hall of Faith, the Hall of Fame in Faith, Abraham is mentioned, and during the 11th chapter, verses 8 through 19, multiple times it says, by faith, and that becomes the rebuke of all who claim righteousness through the law or believe its works will gain merit with the Father. Abraham and Sarah teach us a multitude of lessons. They teach us about failures. When Abraham made his excursion to Egypt during the time of famine, he became fearful of trusting God's promises. He lied about Sarah being his wife and said she was his sister. And even Pharaoh recognized that something was wrong with that story and plagues came on his house until he finally called Abraham and said, what did you tell me? These things are happening to me. Tell me the truth. And Abraham finally confessed that Sarah indeed was his wife and Pharaoh restored him, them to their relationship. That was just one of the tests of Abraham's faith in which he failed. God gave Abraham another test in which he said, go and sacrifice Isaac, your only son. Now you can imagine Abraham's joy in having this child that was going to be the heir of all of his possessions and going to be the father of those who followed in his line. And God is saying, take him and sacrifice him. That would have been going back to the life that Abraham had before when human sacrifice was a part of Mesopotamia where he lived in Ur of the Chaldees. But Abraham followed up in faith and would have brought Isaac to the point of being sacrificed, but God stopped him. And God has a way of taking away our old false practices and teaching us 
the new truth that he wants us to live by. So it was with Abraham and Isaac. And then Abraham was a man of action. When Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom and his daughters and the rest of his family were involved in uh, heinous acts of sin, uh, the angels came and pulled Lot away before the city was destroyed and Abraham rescued Lot and those who were with him from the city of Sodom. And following that was another example of the life of Christ. Abraham paid tithing to Melchizedek, an interesting figure who comes out of nowhere it seems, and Abraham blesses him and Melchizedek blesses Abraham and that becomes a picture of the priesthood of Christ that's revealed and reflected in the book of Hebrews where we've talked about Abraham already. There's so much to learn from the life of Abraham and when we look closely at this man we see a picture of one who trusts God, one who follows God, and one who builds his understanding of God's plan for him. That's the way it is with you and me, isn't it? We start trusting God, we begin to learn more about God, we follow him, and when we follow him, he begins to fulfill all his plans in our lives. When you read the book of Genesis and you read about Abraham, let that be your guide for growth in Christ which Paul promises to all of us by the presence of the Holy Spirit as he reflects it in the book of Romans. Well, we'll move on next week to another of our Bible characters. I hope you'll join us.